Let's yes. start at the beginning. You started the beginning at Visalia. Of time. Ch- childhood in Visalia. Tell me a little bit about what it was like. <laughs> hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Visalia is it's a hot town. That's, it's hot temperature wise, not like there's a lot going on. Yeah. It's just hot. What'd your parents do? Um well, I was uh, in foster care, so when someone asked me about my parents, I think of my foster parents because I was with them since I was five. My dad worked for uh, Reese Food Products. Uh, they make frozen burritos. and He was pretty high up in that company because he started with them. Um, and then my mom was at home sometimes, and then she worked. Uh, she was like secretarial for doctors a lot. She kind of specialized in that. And then she worked at a prison later as a guard. Um, but it was kind of up and down because my dad made a lot of money for a few years and then he lost that job and then we did not make much money and so it was like feast or famine kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were they, were you always kind of interested in the arts as a kid and drawing? Uh, well, I was always drawing. It's kind of like when I think about people coming up and they ask me, young people are like, how to get an art? How do I? I usually tell them don't do it. I say, you know, don't be an artist unless you can't not do it. And that's kind of how I was growing up. It was like, I was drawing all the time. I couldn't help it. I was drawing all over my homework assignments, on the back of papers, on on the walls, in my books, whatever. And it was like, I couldn't stop. That's how I was. Were they supportive in those early kind of years? Uh, Well, my my mom was really, my mom was really supportive when I was younger, but at the same time, constantly telling me that uh, I couldn't make money as an artist. And just like, oh, that's very nice, mijo. Oh, that's very nice. But, you know, you artists don't make money until they're dead. <laughs> so, uh, so it was kind of nice to get the compliments. But it was like, okay, I know I can't do this. So not because of skill or something, but it's like, this is that's a dumb job, being an artist. Yeah. So. What do you feel kind of drew you to just art in general and history and those kind of things that you know, I think about that a lot, try to figure out for myself. In terms of art, I think it's one of those things you just have in you or you don't. And and it's not even a skill thing. I see people all the time that don't have much skill but love drawing. And it's like, that's fine, just create stuff, whatever. And then I see other people who have just absolutely no desire to create anything ever. And that's fine too, it's like different people. Um, but in terms of history, I think I always liked the stories history was just like a bunch of stories to me and then the idea that they really happened and if you study history a lot there's a lot of weird real stories that happened um and now getting older i see things like um star wars just released this huge encyclopedia set have you seen that it's like the encyclopedia of star wars is like this big literally on a bookshelf and i'm thinking why would somebody read that like instead of taking the time to read that you could read some real history because it's probably taken from real and that's true too yeah because like everyone knows not everyone knows but like the first star wars was based on world war ii and the the sith were the nazis and all that stuff and so now they've created a fake history of you know two times removed from real history maybe it's this desire that we have to escape right and go into this other world well i i i think that's even there in regular history like real history if i'm deep into it enough like just recently i got really into ancient egypt and so i was reading a lot of books and one of the books I got was uh, the Ancient Egyptologist Handbook or something. And it was all about the first Egyptologists in the 1800s who went there and did sketches. And so this book was mostly pictures of sketches and drawings that they did of stuff that's not there today, like that fell apart or looters took or whatever. And so some of these things were pictures I'd never seen, like some of the uh, temples were covered in sand and the locals just built houses on them. And now we've seen those temples for what they are. They've removed all the sand and they're amazing. But it's kind of like a time traveler getting to go back to this specific moment, looking back to an either further far moment. And that's pretty amazing that we get to do that. What was your support group like as a kid? You know, you're you're drawing, you're kind of, a lot of times uh, drawing is kind of a solitary affair, right? Just kind of Mm -hmm. in your room, you know, doodling or drawing on something. What kind of... Did you have a mentor? Did you have like a, a crew that you guys drew together with? How was that in uh, your early day? I always think about, there's this Van Morrison album called No Guru, No Method, No Teacher. Hmm. And I always think of, that was me growing up because hmm. I had no friends that were artists. I had friends, but none of them were artists. None of them collected comic books. None of them liked the really nerdy stuff that I liked. 
And so it was always kind of compartmentalized. And it's like, okay, these are my nerd things. I do that by myself. Now I'm going to go out and party with my friends or whatever. And I remember sometimes like in high school watching a show uh, called Weird Science. And they would show it on TV. And it was such a weird show. And it was on like 1130 at night. And so my friends was, hey, let's go hang out. Let's go do something. And they're like, okay, I can hang out at 12. And I got to wait till this episode of Weird Science is over, you know. And some of them knew that about me. And they were cool about it. They would joke around a little bit. But that was just my thing. And I, I had no people that I worked with. And even taking like art classes in high school, the stuff I wanted to do was so different than everyone else. Not that I was super forward thinking or anything, but I wanted to make comic books. And they all wanted to be fine artists and compete for who was the best renderer. And I just never wanted to buy into that. And um, I was good enough, though, in high school to where my art teacher let me do whatever I wanted. And then I, some of the other art students kind of didn't like that. And so they kind of like were hostile towards me. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, like I remember one time I was working on this huge piece, this huge paper cardboard piece. It was big. And I was going to draw all over like super detailed, like some kind of Jeff Darrow drawing, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it was very at the time I was into like naturalist stuff. So it was like fairies and plants. And I was starting on it and I left it there. And then I came back a few days later and someone had spilled turpentine all over it. And I was talking to our teacher, and I was like, oh, well, you know, that, it happens. It's, you know, no big deal. It's an accident. And he was like, I don't think it was an accident. And I was like, oh, okay. But, but I didn't care. Like, I, I, I drew at that time because I had to, and I couldn't stop. But I didn't really care that much, which was detrimental to me because when my teacher said, well, draw whatever you want, I just drew what I felt like. I didn't put effort into being better or challenging myself. I just, whatever I felt like doing, I did. Who did you emulate or what were those early inspirations that you kind of like, you know, as a kid, yeah. you copy somebody or you kind of like look to? Yeah, I would say, because I remember drawing as a kid, copying out of books and I had a, a Disney art book as a kid and I would kind of copy the characters out of it. And I liked copying them, but I knew that wasn't what I wanted to draw for myself. But I, I did that. And then comic books. So I'd be sitting there copying like Jim Lee covers or whatever, or Mike Mignola covers and um, I kind of learned comic books by copying those guys a little bit. Um, and then I would look at, cause I had a set of encyclopedias in my room. Like they were in my room, the family encyclopedias. So I'd go through and look up various artists like Da Vinci or whatever and copy some of his, but not like his paintings, but I liked copying his schematics. Oh, yeah. oh, so yeah. I would draw like, I remember he had like a, a airplane and I just drew it like really detailed and copied it. So I don't know, maybe that says something too. I had no desire to copy the Mona Lisa, right. but I was like, ooh, these schematics, those are cool. Mm-hmm. The so, tectrons. Yeah, the tectrons. Um, and then later on, as you matured into <clears throat> art and comics and, and graphic design, who are your inspirations now or, or just of the last 20 years? Are there certain people <clears throat> that you're like, oh, I, I love this guy or I follow them? Or... Not really. Um, even as an adult, I just feel like I'm, on an island when it comes to what I do, which is fine. I'm so used to it. There are some artists I look up to in a different sense, like Dave Stevens, because he was an independent artist. He was a good renderer um, and he drew cool stuff, Um, but also he got a movie deal. It was kind of the dream, like this independent comic guy. He owned his creation. He got a movie deal. Unfortunately, he died very young, Um, but he's an inspiration to me. Uh, and then there's some artists kind of that I just kind of see every once in a while. I'm like, oh, I like that piece. Like Terry Dodson, I love his work. Um, but mostly it's, I like the subject rather than the creator. And so I, you know, I follow hashtags for Diesel Punk or Machines or Mechs. Um, and every once in a while I'll see an art piece I really like and maybe I'll save it or something as inspiration. Mm-hmm. But I can't really say there's artists that I follow. Let's talk. Let's talk comics as the Art of Comics channel for just a second. What are your favorite comics? Let's just go total geek nerd for just just a quick second. Mm, yeah. Favorite comics that you love, or are there any that you're like, okay, I love? This yeah, you know, it's hard because I loved comics growing up, but I loved comics kind of in the way I loved making art. I just mm. had to. It's like, oh, here's a comic, and it's beamed directly in my brain, and I need more of them. And so when I was a kid, I didn't treat my comics with uh, 
like reverie, you know, like I didn't revere them. I just threw them in a box. And so when I went through later, I didn't have all the, the key issues from the 90s. I just had stuff I wanted to read and most of them weren't bagged and boarded. And so it was kind of worthless. Um, but at the same time, I just read whatever. I would walk into my comic shop as a kid and I'd read like Negative Burn. I'd read Yasagi Yojimbo, but I wasn't like, I need the first appearance. I just re read one and I'm like, oh, I got it. And then you read something else, you know. Um, in terms of the medium, I think it's kind of the hits that everyone says. Um, like Long Halloween is just a great example of comic book storytelling. Yeah. Watchmen is insane, especially if you read the scripts. Not read them, but if you just look at a page or two of the script and see <laughs> what he had that guy draw, you know, I mean, it's like, that's insane. Um, earlier, you mentioned artists that I look up to, whatever, and I guess I forgot. Um, Chris Ware is an artist I really look up to. From saw him at Comic-Con, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got something signed by him. I got something signed by him. I don't even know what I did. I didn't care about the signature, but it was cool to meet him. Yeah. And then next to Chip, uh, next to him was Chip Kidd, who is also another hero of mine. And because both of those guys come at it more from a design point of view, um, and I like thinking of that because, like I keep, like I mentioned a couple of times, when you get too into the drawing, it becomes this rendering competition, and it's like who can make something the most photorealistic. And to me, that's not an interesting challenge. It's interesting when I see people do it well. It's like wow, they're good at that. But for me, it's like I don't want to compete in that lane. And so design gives you an opportunity to create something in a different way and kind of th combine mediums and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so like Chris Ware, I loved, um, what is it? The, Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth. I remember picking that up when it came out. Yeah. And that was one of the books when I picked it up, I cherished it. And I was like, wow, this is yeah. different. And it was a different size and everything. Yeah. And when I went through my collection recently, it was like, those were taken care of. Those are in bags and boards. Yeah, I had the same experience with that book like i remember i was just getting into kind of indie books i was kind of a late bloomer with the indie world and i was just getting into indie stuff um i picked it up right after my divorce i think if i remember i moved to ventura and somehow i heard about it or got a copy and when i just opened it i was just like this is not com this is like another thing yeah but like it felt like a transcending yeah the, it's the, pushing the know? medium uh, yeah yeah so i can never say enough good words and you know, there's plenty of stories everywhere. There's good comics, there's good movies, there's good TV shows. Right now, we live in this glut of good storytelling, fortunately or unfortunately. And so when you see someone like that really pushing the medium, like in comics, it's Chris Ware, he did it. Um, in movies, it's uh, the Daniels with everything, everywhere all at once, you know? And you that's what interests me. Um, yeah, good story, that's nice to, you can watch it while you're working or you can read it before you go to bed. But the people that are really pushing the medium, that's what inspires me. And I know, and this is not to like beat myself up, I know I can't work at that level. I know I am not that person. And so what I try to do is take what those people are doing and translate it to something that's going to help me pay my bills and let me keep making art. And that's my whole comic career is that. It's like I knew out of the gate, like, okay, I want to make a comic book. And really my first comic book, I made Adventures of the 1996. I made the first book so that I could get a job doing graphic design for a comic book company. And I was like, well, no one's hiring me. And it was hard, a little harder back then with social media and internet. No one's hiring me to do anything. I'm gonna do this whole thing. The colors, the flats, the line art, the text, whatever. I'm gonna show it to some companies and say, hey, do you need someone in your design room? But what happened, you probably know, but what happened was uh, the first book was nominated for an Eisner for promising newcomer and then I was working so hard at that point that book was 130 pages mm -hmm. and then I, I got the second graphic novel out within a year and so I got nominated again and I was thinking well maybe I should just do this so I did that for a little while and it worked and it kind of took me out of the direction of working for a publisher because once you go so far down your own path it's hard to step away from that and say, okay, what does this company want me to make? Or, um, but it worked out. Well, because now you have a, now you actually have, I hate to use these words like brand because they're just so ubiquitous, but now you have this body of work and a specific design and you don't want to let all that go, all that equity to yeah. then go work for this other dude's designs, which is, you know, Batman or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
that's that's always well know. i think equity is a good way to look at it but also i think it just depends how successful your brand is um, because i know a lot of guys we've been a lot of guys along the way who have great day jobs and they're making comics on the side yeah. and that's fine that's one way to do it uh, but there was a point where i was working as a designer and i was trying to finish up one of my books and i was thinking no, yeah 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 and i was tr i was thinking my day job is now taking away from my second job and my second job pays me more than this and that's when i quit my day right. job and went to go do comics full time and then there was a point it kind of came back around full circle there was a point where okay i've mastered making my own comic books um, I'm going to pull back from conventions a little bit because I was doing a lot at the time. Now I have a little more time to introduce some side gigs and stuff like that. And so in the past few years, I've been doing a few more side gigs. But I'm still not at the point where I really look for side gigs uh, because very quickly you could get bogged down with doing stuff for other people. And um, I still would like to finish my book series. Of course. Yeah. What are you most proud of? The, the element. This is funny. Yeah. I... You know, I've made a couple books and different things, and I think there's this, there's a patch. Oh, here it is, my space bear patch. Yeah. I love this little patch for some reason. That I like, I just love the way that turned out. Is yeah. There something that you just like, man, I really love this. I think, like I have one behind me. I think my favorite project was actually, the um, cards. yeah, the card set. I have them. <laughs> um, I'm a backer. And I don't know. It's kind of simple, but. It was like design in its purest form and there wasn't storytelling involved which usually I like storytelling because I like that in the comic books but for that one job it just really allowed me to get into the details of graphic design and and it's kind of fun sometimes to get lost in that because you get obsessed with where the pixels are gonna you're moving one pixel at a time but you know it matters I, I think it's frustrating when you're doing that stuff like in a comic book you have 130 pages and I'm working on page 99 and it's going great. And this page is amazing, but you know, it's going to be like this yep. and done, you know, and that's, I don't, I don't know what that is. That's a weird feeling. Yeah. But with the cards, it's like, okay, anyone who touches these is going to be staring at them over and over again, every time they play with them. Um, and it was very well received too. The decks were very well received. So the, I'll just tell you what I think. They're brilliant. The design is really well done. The fact that you put a lot of care into history, that you research all these characters, all these, not characters, but people, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Amelia Earhart. I mean, they are larger than life characters. Yeah. That's, and, and you, that's what's... You put them into yeah. the, your product. And I think a lot of people dig that. A lot of yeah. people. You know, um, Miyazaki, um, he says he he makes movies for nine-year-old girls mm -hmm. that's what he said um and then i would say well you tell me who's your audience well i think it's kind of changed over time too yeah. but i always liked the idea of when i first started um because i i've been going to san diego comic-con for years now you know since 97 as a fan and i remember getting things as a kid and then seeing that same creator 10 years later or something and following up with them and getting something. So I always liked the idea of, you know, writing and drawing for young people who would grow with the series and then as an adult finish the series or something. I like that. That was my target audience. But now, you know, getting more into it and things change all the time. So things and culture has changed. I like the idea of reconnecting with the real history of it. I'm, a lot of the projects I'm doing now, aside from if I can keep working on my book, but a lot of the little side things I produce now are just totally dealing with the real history. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think young people are exposed to history the same way our generation was. Like our generation or my generation was the last to kind of like history is there. You turn on cable and or even when you're a kid and you don't have cable and there's only five channels and you flip around and you pick the best one. You don't get to pick exactly what you want to watch and so you're, in that way you're exposed to world war ii stuff cowboy stuff all kinds of things but now with young people it's like they're on tiktok or whatever and they don't like it they change it you know yeah yeah it's 
definitely changing. I mean, when I look at like if I if I look at who buys my books, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, well, the kids' books, families, right? So moms and dads buy the children the space fair books. But yeah. it's, who buys the comic for I Missouri? It's almost always older women, guys. You know, older guys. I, I'm, th- I'm thirty plus, not old. Yeah, yeah. Thirty plus guys, and and a lot of women. Yeah. Because of the dress, because of the costuming, because of the period stuff, there's a, a bit of a romantic element to uh-huh. you know, the, some of the drawings, and so that's it's not kids, it's not you know a twelve year old does not pick up my book, and I just yeah. and I didn't necessarily make it for it. I just made it because I this is what I did, right? And it's it's always been fascinating when I go to con like who buys this like okay. And when yeah. a kid gets it, I'm, I'm like, whoa. Really? No, I agree. Yeah. Like, okay, if cool. if a kid <laughs> buys my book, it means, no offense to the adults, but it means a lot more yeah. uh, for some reason. Sure. I think oh, maybe because yeah. the idea is like, I know they're going to grow with it. And I know how influential things we read at that age were to us. And so it's like, wow, this kid's going to read it and he's going to read it again. And he's going to draw pictures out of it or whatever. So that's yeah. a lot. But that's another reason why I produce a lot of other things. Is because I know maybe my book isn't for everybody, but I want to just keep making things, and so I have like T-shirts and patches and bags or whatever. You 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 get once we were making towns, you know, going down. I think we were going up in San Francisco, for uh-huh. Ape, which I loved. Yeah, it was such a good show. The last year and, of Ape was really good. Know, so yeah. Good. Um, and you had this. Con- you gave me this concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. Consuming versus producing. And I remember it. I still remember it. And it was like, mm-hmm. you know, you if you're consuming, if you're spending all your time consuming products, you don't have time to produce. Yeah. It, either one or the other, or there's a there's a bit of a balance there that you yeah. have to do. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me, break that down. Well, I think for me, it was literally a year that I went to San Diego, and I had a good job that year, and you know, I. So I had a big budget to go spend on stuff, and I'm there at San Diego, and I have I don't I'm I don't know what the number was maybe like three thousand to spend on the floor, and I'm like this is the year I'm gonna go big, and I just remember thinking I don't I don't want any of this stuff I want to be making this stuff, and I should be on the other side of that table, and that was really the moment it clicked for me, and at that point I had to kind of tune out a lot of distractions, um, and just start working. And there was a, a year or two where I really just cut everything off. I'd watch shows while I worked or something on the TV, but um, I didn't. I kind of stopped reading comics because sometimes those things are a distraction, not just the time reading them, but it, they take you down a different direction. And so it's good, like in between books, I want to experience things and, and inhale some new material. Um, but at some point when I'm really creating, I have to put it down and just start making my own thing. Yeah. yeah, but it's still it is important to kind of refill the well every once in a while. But a lot of people go too far that direction and get sucked into it. Yeah, especially because there's so many options now. Yeah, all the time. Um, what makes a good comic convention? Let's let's go and talk about that world because you've been in that world for a while. Mm-hmm. You've been all over. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, from the side of making a con, I don't know because I haven't like promoted one or anything like that but the vibe when you get there i think having a good mix of um, creators artists even merch sellers just having a good mix uh, having a few other things going on you know costume contests or things like that Um, the convention center can go a lot into it a good center or bad convention center can kind of take away from it um so just the vibe, the vibe that, that you walk in and there's a lot to see and a lot of different things to see. Because I've been to cons where the artist alley is huge. So much artist alley and it's like, okay, that's, that's, that's a bit much. Uh, and I've been to cons where there's barely any artist alley. It's all vendor booths. And then to fill it, they start bringing in like insurance companies or things like that. And um, that's not really fun either. So I think having a good mix is important. Um, but for me as a seller, it's just a lot of people. It's a numbers game. If you get a ton of people, odds are if you get 130,000 people, people walking by, some people are going to buy some stuff from you, right? 
Uh, I've also done okay at smaller shows when there's not too many vendors. So it's just that balance between vendors and people coming in. Yeah, it's <clears throat> um, it's weird because uh, in the big shows, I do feel lost in the shuffle because there's so many, the competition, there's yeah. so many things you're competing against, right? And, yeah. um, you know, that's just difficult. Um, at the smaller shows, though, I'm not competing against people, but then there's just no traffic. You know, there's yeah. nobody there. Um, yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've done really well at some small ones. I've done really well at some big ones. And and then there's placement is an issue. I remember at, El, uh, at uh, Seattle. Yeah, yeah, Emerald, Emerald City, City. Yeah. When I was with the Chashkis and the Taiwanese toys and stuff, and I wasn't mm. with any of the comics at all. Mm. I was, like, relegated to this other spot, and that just... Broke me, I think, in some ways. I mean, yeah. I, I do feel your product does kind of like always elevate, but well, there are little like gamey little like strategy things to tactics. You know, I think it is tactical. Which that part of it, I I used to really like. That's when I started, yeah. and and I booth next to this. And well, I mean, you can't necessarily <laughs> choose where you're on the floor. Um, so it's, I remember in the first few years, there was always a huge moment of the floor plans out. Where am I at? You know, and it was huge. <laughs> And then after a while doing the same show, you'd get the same placement. Um, but I used to think about it in terms of really picturing people walking by a booth. You're in a hurry. You're going to get nachos or something. What's going to make them stop and say, oh, what's that? And so maybe it's out of my book. What is the most interesting character in that book? Can I put them on a little sign and get them to come in? Uh, but still being authentic, not putting something that's not really in the book or um, over featuring something that doesn't play into it, yeah. uh, but I like that mentality. But how do you get somebody to stop and look? Yeah, I, one year I was at Kamikaze, and right across from me was the Playboy models, like three or four of them. And, yeah, you know, you're just not going to be able to compete with the Playboy model mm -hmm. the, the, because the crowd is always pointed towards them. Yeah, to take pictures to get the the ten by eight. So you took your top off. It didn't work. So I said, yeah, you know, two can play this game. Yeah. No, so then I, you know, that's when you have to be engaged. That's when I feel part yeah. of it is you do got to kind of like stand up. You got to talk to people. Yeah. You got to like, you got to work it. You know what I mean? You got to work yeah. it. Yeah. Without being like too annoying about you it. You be like P.T. Barnum. Yeah. When I first started, I was doing a lot more of standing all the time, making yeah. eye contact with everyone that goes by, saying hi. You're, you don't do that so much now, huh? Don't you kind of like just... Chill? Uh, I, remember I, I remember I was a little bit more aggressive and you were yeah. like, chill out, dude. Chill out, chill out. I think I'm now aggressive. I've done it so much, I kind of... Especially at shows like San Diego where you're getting 100,000 people, yeah. you kind of feel the crowd and there's busy times, there's slow times, you got to pace yourself. And then I've tried to create my signage and my booth to do some of that talking for me. Mm, yeah. Right. But I know when I was in small press and I just had one table... You really had to catch people. You, yeah. And sometimes it wasn't necessarily like, hey, come over here. I got a book for you. It was just a hi. Yeah, that's just you, a high. Yeah. yeah, that's enough for them to just yeah. kind of look your way. And then they'll look and either they're interested or they're not. Yeah, there was yeah. a guy next, another story, guy next to me. And he was like, hey, do you like Scooby-Doo mixed with Harry Potter? And he said that for three days straight. Yeah. Scooby-Doo mixed with Harry Potter. Do you like scooby -Doo? And I was just like, I'm going to assassinate someone because yeah. you know because he's he, but it's just a little too much like you well, said it's just an just an acknowledgement and yeah. how's it going how you doing today that's enough to have people pause and go oh. yeah and then they look at you it. just want yeah. them to register that you're there yep because then that much effort it's not the return is not there so if he's putting that much effort into getting people to stop how many more books is he selling than he would have sold otherwise two more books maybe but then he's completely exhausted. So there's some if that's what he's relying on to sell books or anybody, then there's something wrong with your display and you gotta rethink that. You know. Because your display should be working for you too, just like they do in Target or Vons or Walmart. People have displays set up that get people to notice their product. So that can be from the cover design or some signage you have at your booth or a backdrop or whatever. Um, but just something so that they'll notice you. How have you seen the industry change over the last 10 years? What is different? You are not only, you've done a lot, 
you're doing you're kind of on every level of the supply chain. You create yeah. comics. You're a vendor. You're also a retailer. Yeah. You're a self publisher. I mean, you're all yeah, through so the process. Yeah. So in that. So in those first few years, I like I said, I started making my comic and it did well, and so I kept going with it. And which it's kind of funny if someone's watching this and they're like, I've never heard of his comic. It's almost like a, a secret way to do well. No wholesale, just selling yourself, which means you keep a hundred percent of every book you sell minus production costs, which I did on Kickstarter, and so I did very well those first few years, enough to be able to invest in. Uh, starting up a comic book shop so we started a comic book shop and now we own two locations and there's a shipping warehouse and so yeah in the last 10 years because the shop's been open almost 10 years uh in the last 10 years i've really seen the industry change at the ebbs and flows and some of the big changes are there was a time when a comic book movie would come out and we would see a benefit in sales that is like the opposite almost now. Really? It's like people, if they're not even interested in the movie, they're definitely not interested in comic. It's like now it's too much. Before it was like, oh, I like this. I want more. Where can I get more? Now there's so much, you know, in television and movies. It's like, oh, I have enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that used to be a selling point. Like, oh, you like that? Here's some more. Mm -hmm. Now it's not. And then in the last few years, the, uh, the big publishers, especially DC and Marvel, um, they're leaning so heavily on the multimedia aspect that the books are kind of more and more. They're just like the stepchild that they don't want to pay attention to. Um, and they're there and they sell, but they're not selling the way they used to. And so in order to make up those profit margins, they have more titles and they're doing more variant covers. And so that stuff more titles means they can't all be good and so you're losing readers that way because there's if you're buying more titles you're dropping off more titles so it's you know different qualities. yeah because you know if you're a subscriber and like oh now there's five books out okay for one you know character let me buy all five of those books but they're not good now i'm buying none you know it's, that sounds kind of kind of counterintuitive because if an industry or a business is not doing well you go lean you go okay we had 30 titles we're going to go to 20 because we need to get keep those strong. Well, you're saying that that actually, even though the industry is going lean, they blow up there. Yeah, because the the advantage, and this is what I told a lot of people when I first started putting my book out, is like what you have to remember is your product. If it's a comic book, it's a floppy, you know, soft cover, twenty pages. Your product is something other companies give away for free to promote their real product. So our product, in some ways, it's not a product; it's a promotional item because it is so cheap to produce. And so you can go down to a car dealership right now and get a nice glossy catalog for every single one of the cars they produce. And it's nicer than any comic book you've gotten, right? And those are free. They're giving away those for free. Um, so when it comes to them upping production, it's really cheap. They're selling ad space. And the cost to pay artists is so cheap because there's always up and coming hungry artists who are going to fight for that job. And so that's why artist page pay rates have not really gone up since the seventies. If you look at how much artists were getting paid in the seventies and adjust for inflation, they're getting paid less now or the same. And yeah, you can have some kind of rock star artist that sells books, but that artist can only produce so many titles in a month. And so Marvel or DC, they're going to go find the next person who's going to do it cheaper and maybe can meet that deadline because they don't have as many pulls on other jobs coming their way, right? So the whole system is kind of built on cheap labor, cheap production, and these companies that own IP that make their money somewhere else. And so they don't care that much, you know? They care a little bit, but yeah. not that much. Um, are you saying that the trend is downward continues? Is the comic book industry dead? What we've been saying I... for... for over a decade I think the comic book industry is is a wave and so it's down and come back up and down but that wave is trending downward so it's a wave trending downward but the thing that keeps it from totally disappearing is it's such a unique medium that all of us creators have a love for it we have a real love for it and so we'll keep buying those indie books and we'll keep supporting that stuff um, but that doesn't inflate wages 
that wages stay low. So that just keeps the medium alive. And then the other thing that keeps it alive are those vintage books, all those old comic books. Most, most, uh, not most, but a lot of comic shops make their money off collections because people still want those old comics and the nostalgia factor is high. Um, so I don't know if comic books will ever completely disappear as a medium, um, but they're not the powerhouse they were. And if you look at the production numbers for whatever the top selling comic book is now, like a Spider-Man or Batman title, um, they're not producing anywhere near the numbers they produced 20 years ago right. or even in the 50s or 60s. Like, right. so. Yeah. Are there uh, companies that are doing something very unique and different? I just saw a press release about, I want to say it's called Distillery or some kind of... I'm not sure about that. There's a new company out there that's uh-huh. kind of like a co-oping with, with yeah. our other creators. Brian Azzarello, mm. Scott Snyder, some of those guys. Yeah. Um, but are there companies out there that are trying to do something different or or really it's just it, the market's going to go where the superhero to go and so it's kind of like this is the way Well, I feel like there's real there's superhero fatigue right now for sure. Yeah. Uh, but the classic heroes they can always just put a hot new artist on a hot new writer, come up with a new take and then bam it's hot again. Yeah. So that's always possible. In terms of these companies on the periphery and doing new things um, it's always possible. I think people are still constantly chasing the Image Comics model. Like when, I- when Image Comics came out of nowhere, they took these big guns from the big companies and then bam, they're a major player. And so every company now that starts up is like, yeah, we want to be the next Image Comics or something. Um, but that's really hard to do. And those companies are realizing how hard it is to do when you don't have that influx of cash from movies that are constantly being made like Marvel and DC. Well, then you also have, though, like Penguin, Pantheon, yeah. Random House. Yeah. Those guys are putting out amazing comics, graphic novels that are kind of going to Target, going to the big stores. Yeah. Tell me about that. So that's true. Those are graphic novels. It's sequential art, yeah. but it's a completely different thing. It's a completely different creation process. It To me, it has more in common with being a writer. Yeah. And if you want to be a writer, you have to find That's an right. agent. Yeah. You have There's just so much gatekeeping in that world. One of the great things about comic books was you could make a comic, go to a comic show, get a job at DC. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the dream, right? And it happened a lot, or Marvel or whatever. Um, but to get in that, through that gate of getting a book put out by Random House or Penguin or something, that's a huge hurdle. And Well, and I yeah. feel like there is a definite... Um, it's just a very different vibe and quality difference too. I mean, that's where we're talking about Chris Ware and some of these guys. Yeah. Are at. Although you know you have like Fanographics and Drawn and Quarterly who are somewhat in the same space as far as like just design and style. Mm-hmm. Um, they are still comic book companies. Where yeah. Random House and Penguin and Pantheon, those are just like an arm of the larger company that does like yeah. know, adult books, right? Like yeah, they're smile, just they're just right? following the numbers. Kids are buying those, so they'll make more. If kids yeah. stop buying them, they will make less. And if you, I've read some of those. Like I've read Smile. It's oh, a great, great yeah. story. I don't and know if I'd say know. brilliant. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's brilliant. It's a good story though. It's fun. The art's clear. But that's the thing. Those things aren't like pushing the envelope. They're just putting these stories forward in a style that the kids appreciate. Mm-hmm. And so they don't need to be cutting it. They don't need to be whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what is smile going to be 40 years from now you know what is the next step on that what is how do you branch off from that how do you create a world out of that and so you have smile you have last kids on earth that came from a prose book and now it's turning into a graphic novel media conglomerate Um, but that's hard and so if you're an up-and-coming creator and you have this like here's my ip here's my story those gatekeepers are going to say yes or no right at the front and then what do you do? You know, um, you go to Kickstarter. <laughs> I guess, yeah. And then what? Self-publish, and then you know you can self-publish and you can make some money, but as you know, it's a lot of work. You're wearing all the hats. You're doing all the work. Um, so yeah, I think that's it's interesting. Like that's moving the medium. I, that's not even moving the medium forward. It's just keeping the medium alive for a new group of readers. Mm-hmm. But 
I don't think that's pushing it forward really. So what would you say to someone who's kind of struggling with their career and feeling like uh, there is gatekeeping or, or my stuff's not good enough or you know what do you do to kind of like give give us a two minute motivational speech not just comics but in the arts and yeah. say hey I'm a creator. Uh, well, I think there's two ways to come up like you can be coming up in the industry and say i want to be the boss i want to be the leader i want to be the top dog whatever um, and that's great but you know like a pyramid there's only so much room at the top and so you're going to end up on one of these other levels um, but if you look at any industry there's always holes that need to be filled and there's always people leaving that industry people that aren't making product anymore who aren't into it and you notice like none of the stuff i just said had to do with art it's any industry, right? Product, art, whatever you're making. And so look at where you're at, look at where you want to be and see where the gaps are, you know? And so for me coming up, I saw those gaps because I went to a lot of conventions and I would analyze them and just kind of out of habit, not even knowing what I wanted to do with it, but be like, oh, look what that person's selling. Interesting. Look what that person's selling. And for me, that was my way in because I knew to get a gig from a comic book company was going to be really hard to do. But at the same time, I also knew that I didn't want to be one of those older guys sitting at a con who hadn't gotten a drawing job in 20 years and they were signing prints of some of their old pages. And no offense to them, I just knew I didn't want to be that guy. And so I said, what can I do differently that's more secure so that I can be making money when I'm that age, you know? And so for me, it was about the whole, you kind of call it a brand earlier. I never think of it as a brand, but just like the whole world, like all the stuff that I make and how it fits together. And I can kind of move off in one direction or go return to my roots a little bit. I'm very flexible because I'm one person and I can just decide what do I want to do next year, you know? And there's pros and cons to that. The pro is the freedom, the complete freedom of doing whatever I want. And then the cons are, yeah, I don't have any support from anybody. So I do have to do it all myself. Uh, but I kind of mentioned earlier how I come full circle. I got to invest in the comic book shop. I have more time, so I'm teaching graphic design now. Um, so everyone should be diversified in what they do because you don't know if any one of those legs is gonna be kicked out from under you. Um, yeah, I draw right now and I design stuff, but what if something happened to my hands? And I'm like, I can't do that, I'm done. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think about those like inkers. Yeah. You know, and, and like they ink, that's what they do. Uh -huh. you know, they might be the best, they could be Scott Williams or whoever, uh -huh. but uh, what happens if Jim Lee suddenly dies? Or what happens if, you know, uh, you know uh, it's like, and you, you, clothing designer, accessory soft goods designer, comics, banners, events, all these different things you're doing. <clears throat> You've diversified those. And maybe on a Tuesday, you're like, I kind of like this. Or on a Wednesday, you might want to do a little of that. Yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit about kind of dream world. Is this the dream world to have this diversified? Or... If you got to go on a, a magic island and just do one thing, what what really grabs you? Is there something yeah. that really grabs you? That you know what I think about a lot is like if I won the lottery, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think what if I won the lottery and I had a hundred million dollars yeah. or something, I think I, I think would. That. Yeah, because <laughs> I think it's a great exercise in like, what do I really want? Right. Because okay. once you have the money to do whatever you want to do, what do you do? Yeah. Right. And so honestly, I'm like, okay, if I have not billions, because billions, yeah, you go buy an island and you have a small army and right, right. Uh, like a couple hundred million or something like whatever. <laughs> so you know, buy once you buy your house, you buy houses for all your friends, and then yeah. what do you do next? Right. So I think I would set up some kind of like warehouse on my property, bring in some like young artists, and just create stuff. And so I would have one of those production houses where I just create and stuff. Andy Warhol, you're like a factory. Yeah, yeah he but he was stick, kind of a yeah, yeah he was kind of a talent vampire. Yeah, and so I have a real desire to see people succeed. Yeah, so like if Basquiat was working for me, I'd be like, kick the drugs, yeah. get clean. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I heard someone describe Warhol as a talent vampire the other day. I was like, oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely one take. Yeah, it's definitely one take. Yeah. No, I, mean, I have nothing against yeah. Warhol. He's but fine. No, yeah. Um, but no, that's what I would do. And so okay. I think about that and then I come back around to like, wow, yeah, I really am doing what I want to do. It's mm-hmm. just if I had more money, I would do it on a different scale mm-hmm. and I'd become more of an art director, which is great because as an art director, you point at someone and go, make this, you make that, you make that and you kind of see it all come up. Mm-hmm. When you are your own art director and production artist, you're like, okay, make this. Oh, but I'm tired. I don't want to make it. And so yeah, it takes longer. Yeah. Because I think some people have more ideas than they have time to produce. And oh. some people are the opposite and they are great at producing but don't have a ton of ideas. And that's totally okay. I've met those people also. Um, and if you can kind of get those people together, that I think, see, I think you and I, it's hard for us to work on something together because we both have a lot of ideas. <laughs> so yeah. one of us needs to be the one that does the work and yeah. neither of us wants to do, want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I need a little minion, a group of minions. Yeah, and I've I've <clears throat> crossed paths with people like that before, but they're, it's always they're on their way to somewhere else. Yeah. And so for a brief time, we can work together. Maybe they work on something, yeah. and then they're on to something else. Yeah. You know. Um, what a great conversation. Really appreciate this. Let's let's end with uh, some final thoughts. Um, strip away comics and art and everything. Uh-huh. Let's just talk a little bit about life the importance that you found through your journey um, you know you have children as you leave this earth as you kind of you know think about what's really important um, what is that what's that message that you would give your kids what is really important to you what's kind of like a, a, a mantra or mission statement? well I think everyone coming up growing up at some point you have to decide why you're here and that's it like you just have to decide why you're here and maybe you're here to be a worker ant maybe you're here to be a queen bee i know it's a mixed metaphor but why are you here and if if you can decide that then you'll be much happier doing whatever you're doing and you'll be much more focused right um but decide and head in that direction like it's kind of that's really simple but that's it and so like you know i was young and i had like a list of things i wanted to accomplish and i think i came really close on those it's like i did them maybe i didn't become a rock star in the comic industry but i did make comic books i remember when i was younger going to san diego thinking like i want to be nominated for an eisner one day i'm gonna be up here and like i got that twice like eight times if you include my shop you know um, but I didn't win. And so there's some kind of point where you have to readjust your goals with reality. Um, but I think it's important to come up with goals and just decide. And a lot of people don't decide why they're here and they don't know. And then that becomes really empty, especially later in life. It's like, why was I here? What did I do? What did I accomplish? Um, and so I encourage my kids to think about that when they're young too. I just say, think about yourself now. Think about yourself 10 years before and then think about yourself 10 years from now and try to live in some way where all three of those people would agree and be like yeah this is good you know because you may be doing something right now and see yourself as failing and like oh i didn't win the eisner but then 10 year old you was like what are you doing dude you were nominated you got to sit next to all these famous people and whatever and then uh, like 60 year old you would be like oh man that was a high point and I should have enjoyed it or whatever yeah. or it doesn't even matter yeah matter. either way yeah something else bigger or whatever and so I just think about I try to think about that and it's like to temper my experiences with who I was and who I want to be um, and then also now that you have kids it's like who do you want them to see you as right so yeah Great. Thank you so much, Paul, again. Yeah. I love chatting with you. Appreciate your time. So thanks. You're welcome.